the threats. This is where technology fails. Um, firstly, thank you very much for coming. Um, it's quite humbling to see how many people came and how many people on the waiting list. And also a massive thanks to Google for doing this. Um, when we did the first OWASP London, it was the very early days of OWASP. And like, it, the industry was really young and immature. Not much has changed. Um, and you know, Ivan said, like, if we got a few people in the room, that was a massive, massive thing. To see everybody here now, like, it is very humbling because this is still quite a small industry. And I thought, like, I've been quite privileged in my career because I've been heavily involved in the offensive scene in the 90s and then morphed into this thing called the World Wide Web and application security. And I've seen a lot of change, and I've seen a lot of things that haven't changed. Um, and part of that is OWASP. And I asked today on Twitter, like, you know, one of the hardest things of when we started OWASP was, do people actually use it? Do people benefit from it? And I asked that, and we got some really good responses. Victoria said, like, you know, she basically moved to Switzerland, and one of the key things was how, you know, it helped the community. Luca, who's a crazy Italian hacker, he's really damn good at doing malicious things, um, said that OWASP was the AppSec pillar of our times. And this was really cool, because like, you, you genuinely don't know, and that's the biggest problem with open source. You, you put your blood and sweat into something, and is anybody using it? Does anybody really give a shit? Um, Simon, you might know him, Zap Proxy. Um, Zap Proxy getting accepted as a project helped me break into AppSec. Like, who here uses Zap? Like, that's, that's phenomenal. Like, um, Mark itself found a really cool story about uh, people in Romania after the brutal regime and how they, you know, used OWASP to get inspiration and that kind of stuff. And then the one that blew me away, um, this man single-handedly has carried application security research for the last five years. Uh, James Kettle is my hero. Um, I sit on the Blackout Review Board and we have an AppSec track and it's, it's a lonely place. Because that part of you thinks, well, you've solved application security, right? There's no real new research coming out. Thank God for this man. Because when he does stuff, he breaks the web. And like he said there, my first ever conference presentation was at OWAP as at EU, and that get me hired at Port Swigger. So like building a community has been incredibly rewarding. Um, just, I can't see my slides here or anything. Technology is awful. Right? Um, but it, I'm going to step back. So. Like I said, in the 90s, I was doing a lot of networking style hacking, as you did. Um, and I was helping build the Financial Times, FD.com was first, during the, during the first dot com, and that really starts to age me now. And these things called web applications going online. And then Jeff came up with this really cool paper that kind of literally changed an entire industry. And the quote was, well, what's the problem, right? A Microsoft SQL Server allows batch commands. Yeah. Is it exploitable? Um, that was 1998. His name was Frame, Frame Forest Puppy. Um, we still have SQL injection. Uh, and what was interesting is if you look at the early web, um, it, it was kind of a bit like young lovers in the dark. We were fumbling and putting fingers in all places. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we were doing stuff. Um, so this one is Apache Scalp. Um, it was a lovely bug. Um, found and made malicious by Gobbles, who were a really cool hacking crew at the time who didn't like the security industry. And IBM's X-Force, the experts at the time, said, it is not exploitable. <laughs> Gobbles said, is it? Uh, and released that code and that became a massive worm. And it was a good foray into understanding how these experts were saying, we know the vulnerabilities, don't worry about it, it's not exploitable. We still hear that today. Um, on the right is a tool written by a friend of mine, Ruloff, uh, who founded a company called SensePost that I used to run. Um, that was a tool used to exploit IIS. This was pre the days of understanding the burden of releasing malicious tools on the internet. We were young, dumb, and full of enthusiasm. And well, to be fair, we were breaking into everything, right? So that's what you did in the 90s, because there was no law enforcement. They were still catching proper bank robbers. Um, then. Kind of something happened. Uh, Mark, on September 24th, 2001, on the WebAppSec mailing list, you know, at the time, the mailing list was really interesting. It was basically people talking about web applications and vulnerabilities, and it was very early days. And he said, you know what? I'm going to start this thing called the Open Web Application Security Project. 
And I think it's really important, it's really cool. And it really was because literally two years later, Bill Gates came out with the trustworthy memo and basically where he said, hey, everybody's been kicking us quite a bit, rightly so, SQL Server 2000 was not the best idea. Um, we kind of need to be responsible in how we build products because people are now using our products to do things online and not just nerdy things anymore. Buying stuff, you know, going onto websites to book movie tickets and such. And as such, they should be built in a way that makes them trustworthy. That was 2002. But what was interesting was, is that right at the start then, there are a few of us who were all still fairly new in the application space. And this, this is kind of the early days of OWASP. Some really cool names here. And by the way, if you ever had noticed that OpenAI has an outage, it's because Dennis Cruz is talking to the bot. <laughs> he hasn't changed, and I love him for that. Um, these are the kind of people that were all exploring a lot of the stuff that we were doing at the time to say, right, you know, how do we do this? How do we build stuff? And Mark and I were looking at these applications coming out. Like I said, I was working at Financial Times. Um, I moved from networking exploitation to these web applications. And I've told the story before. We were building this front end. Uh, they use Lotus Notes. Like, oh my God. Probably one of the worst pieces of software designed by a blind person. Like, but they use Lotus Notes to publish the web application to the web. Like, what the fuck? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That's, that's, that's hardcore stuff. And then there was this database um, called Oracle. And it was unbreakable. And at the time, we had these firewalls from a company called Checkpoint. And they said, we can stop web application attacks because we stop all the ports from being hit. I'm like, well, port 80 is open. We didn't have 443 back then. Port 80 is open, right? The attacks are, okay, ignore me. And we were messing around, and I was throwing garbage at the application. I was getting these ORA errors back. I was like, that's really weird. Why is the database talking to the front end? That's like just wild. This was pre-RFPs research. And it was because basically we were doing injection. We just didn't really know. So Mark and I were like, OK, let's build a book that's open source to teach people how to do web application testing. And that was the foundations of the OWASP testing guide. Work started in 2002. I'm only 23 years old, so I was quite young at the time. And we were like, OK, well, how do people go about testing these web applications that people are building? You know, these applications written in Perl, CGI scripts, <clears throat> really bad insecure languages, or the languages I like to think of as most security application vendors today still use. Um, Avanti, Fortinet, all these other ones. I didn't do that. Oh, OK. So I, I thought about it like as a history. We've gone through a lot of revolutions. Now, the first revolution is there was a library called Whisker. Um, anybody here remember or use Whisker? One person, thank god. Um, it was written by Rainforest Puppy, <clears throat> and it was used to start interacting with applications in a way. And it was really important because for me, this was the foundation of web application testing tools. Out of Whisker came Achilles. Achilles was the first web application specific proxy that allowed you to sit in between the browser and manipulate things. And that was really important. The interface was incredibly basic. You could still manipulate your stuff. You could do your little damage and send it on. Then came Exodus, written by a very good friend of mine, Rogan, who we worked together. Um, Exodus was basically Rogan's foray into learning how to do Java, which is a weird language, right? Because anybody here a Java developer? Thank one, odd people. But we love you, but it's a strange language. So like to build a, a proxy in Java, you think, Rogan, dude, you need to get a girlfriend, babe. Um, <laughs> but it worked because now all of a sudden we could start stacking up the application requests. And we could start to understand how these applications are being built. <clears throat> Bear in mind, it was CGI scripts and Pulse scripts and everything else. And that was amazing <coughs> because when we started to build these first level <coughs> sorry, I'm still recovering from pneumonia, <clears throat> these applications, it was a mess, right? At the time, DoubleClick 
was coming about with internet advertising. So you had these things all over the top and they were calling, like Dennis said, different boxes somewhere, an Oracle box over here that was firewalled off. And you had to really understand how to break stuff. And at the time, development wasn't really where it was today. It was still unicorn dev, right? You went from system requirements all the way through to operations and kind of there, right? Security testing happened. Now at the time, I wasn't hired as a, a penetration tester. That industry didn't exist when we were doing it. My job was a s sort of system administrator, building PSI net and the early internet that we had around here, and then for Financial Times. But my main thing was, can you annoy the shit out of the developers? Mm -hmm. And that's why I kind of fitted into here, right? Like this operation thing. So I was like, okay, I need to learn how to build applications. And that was a wild time. And what came out of it, was the second revolution. So now we had the tools, right? We sort of had the knowledge because we were writing the testing guide and the project. Um, we were also doing very stupid, stupid things. Um, on the left is a website called hack.coza. Um, I left the UK when I was 10, moved to South Africa. Um, Govboy and myself and a few others, we had this website where we used to share exploit code to other people. Um, and we used to give bugs away for free because we were bad business people. So you would find a vulnerability, you'd write your exploit code, you would use it on the internet, you get bored, you share it with other groups, TSO, woo woo, or whatever, and then you put it onto the website and then other people could use it. Zero responsibility, right? Because bad people use bad things with bad stuff like that. But looking back, it was a different time. But the, we were teaching people how to break applications, how to test things, how to do pen testing. And that was really important because the testing guide for me was my first foray into really understanding the power of the community and how we could really change people's mindsets and lives. And we had lots of people coming to us afterwards and saying, I changed careers because of the testing guide. Anybody here ever read the testing guide or used the testing guide? So a handful of people, which is quite cool, right? And that's grown on to these really big things. It's a version five now, and it's doing an amazing job. But what came out of it was we finally had a big change in how businesses saw security. This lady on the left is a very good friend of mine, Justine Bone. She is a badass hacker. Like genuinely, at the time when she was working with IBM X-Force, with people like Dave Attell, who just left the NSA, her sole responsibility was an application security team where her team of four, I think, or four or five people, this was 2004, five-ish, basically were responsible for looking at the commits that were going into um, the repo. Oh, magic, thank you. And looking at security bugs. And in 2004 or five, that was quite unheard of because one, there was somebody responsible for application security, which had never really been talked about before. And also companies were starting to go, Maybe we need to start thinking about this. And then we have the third revolution, right? And this is where it, it gained traction. And like I said, I've been involved in Black Hat, I've got another 20 years, Jesus Christ. Um, we first had a <coughs> Black Hat application specific paper in 2003, right? And it was very much the early days. And then in 2006, we had the next one. So it took three years before we started to see people actively researching applications. And they were looking at beyond the normal stack of the web servers and so on. They were looking at application frameworks and how people were doing stuff. And that was really important because that for me kickstarted a massive amount of research that we saw after that. What came out of that was a hell of a lot of tools. Um, there was a lot of strange things like real player, which was, you know, we can thank the porn industry for web streaming we can be brutally honest. But Burp Suite came out, and that was version one. And for the first time, we had something that had a proxy. Well, we had that with Achilles and Exodus and Paros and all that kind of stuff. But we had a thing called a spider, where we could now automate scraping of the website to build up an attack tree, really important. We had a thing called an intruder. We're like, ooh, we have tools now. We can now fuzz stuff, all right? And then we had repeater. Burp itself commoditize application testing, where now you had teams be able to use a tool, understand how applications work, because we had books written about it, we had talks written about it, and now we saw a massive industry start to come up. 
And that was really cool because we were like, wow, this thing's growing really heavily. And then we saw the rise of DevOps. At the first, you had the antiquated technology called Jenkins. Um, nobody here uses Jenkins still, right? <laughs> but it was the telephone. It was the old analog telephone. <laughs> yeah, that's Jenkins. And it was great because all of a sudden we saw how you could put stuff in your pipeline and maybe think about security. Maybe run Bandit, right? If we're going to go crazy. Then it kind of became the iPhone, right? <coughs> Where we had Circle CI. And you're like, the UI was getting better and it was talking more to developers. You're like, oh my God, this, this is exciting. And when the first iPhone came out, I loved my Sony Ericsson, right? I loved my Motorola Flip. And this iPhone came out with no apps and you're like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this shit? The reality was the Circle CI was that. People started to see the power of going, you know what? Doing a pen test at the end of the, the application build, that's not probably the best thing, right? We're starting to learn. Where we are now is GitHub, um, and GitLab, if anybody uses GitLab. And we've now started to see where application security, as Dinner said, is that <coughs> it's so as part of the life cycle that you don't even think about it anymore. Right? We got used to the fully automated worlds of doing things. But that kind of gave rise to a very ugly period of security that, to be fair, we were all involved in the time, but it wasn't the best time. And that was where security blocked everything, right? We all did it. You're not going to release that on the internet because it's possibly insecure. Security says no. We've all done it. We were all there. Developers are stupid, man. Like, what an idiot. Doesn't understand SQL injection. What a prick. We all did it. That period is literally the bit that I try to forget because, wow, we did things wrong. And there's a really great book <coughs> written by Gene Kim, Gene Kim, The Phoenix Project. It's a phenomenal book if everybody's not read it. But it really delves into how information security is always flashing their badges at people and making urgent demands, All right? Regardless of the consequences of the rest of the organization, which is why we don't invite them to many meetings. That quote's never left my head. And if you look back at security at the time, especially application security, you're like, wow, we weren't embracing developers. Then we come onto the fourth revolution. And this is where I think we're doing the most things. Now, I need to caveat that. I think normal people are doing the right things. I have a big beef with the security appliance industry. I think single-handedly, they are the biggest cancer that we have on the internet. The products that are meant to keep us secure are built using bubble gum, old toilet rolls, and people who truly do not give a shit about our security. The firewall vendors, the VPN vendors, the secure application vendors, the ones that the Chinese love so much. The VPNs that use CGI scripts with 15-year-old supply chain things and still sell, they are the problem. And if any of you probably unfortunately follow me on Twitter, you know I do not give a shit anymore. I am calling these idiots out because my data is on more toilet walls than I care to imagine. Those people are not doing the cool fourth revolution. But what we have seen a massive change of is tooling. As Dennis alluded to, we are going to start seeing a fifth revolution soon. And that's going to be the rise of people understanding how to use LLMs. When he said about putting LLMs in line, I'm like, oh, shit, shits and giggles, do it. What is the worst that could happen? Putting APIs to an LLM, ooh, that's interesting. Do it, but have a rollback. But I think we're going to see better tooling because up until now, security tooling in the application space hasn't been the best. DAST tooling. When I started to play around with DAS tooling with GitHub pipelines and actions, big name vendors came to me and said, yeah, we support GitHub actions. Here is a 64 meg jar file that goes in your build pipeline. I'm like, oh shit, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it builds, the pipeline will be busy for four and a half hours while we do our DAS scan. I'm like, and what, pray tell, do developers do? We had to do some seriously creative hacks. We have other SaaS tools that still today expect you to upload a zip file of your repo into their 1997 Lotus Notes inspired console to run a report and you get back a PDF. Uh, these are tools that are sold at RSA. So the security industry is not the one evolving and I'm hoping this is where we start to kickstart it. Automation truly has made things phenomenal. Um, <coughs> at Black Hat December, 
myself and a few colleagues released a bit of research. We're doing a lot on post-quantum cryptography, which for a blonde like me is a hard word to say, but we are doing it. And we had an itch. And I said at the time, I wonder how many of the world's open source packages, the supply chain that we all talk about, are vulnerable to not supporting post-quantum ciphers. And we said, right, how do we do this at scale? Because what we need to do is take CodeQL, which I am the ultimate fanboy in. I think it's one of the best variant analysis, static analysis frameworks out there. But how do we run it across thousands of GitHub repos? So I bamboozled friends at GitHub and said, hey, Nero, I got this idea. And we did. We worked with Microsoft, and we got GitHub, and we wrote the CodeQL queries, and we decided to run it across the top 5,000 dependencies on GitHub. This is the stuff that the world builds upon. We could not have done so without automation, without GitHub Actions, without automating that scale. And this was securities, this was variant analysis at scale. And for me, it kind of dawned upon me, I was like, wow, in 20 odd years, we've gone from, if you want to do a static analysis review of a site, it was mostly manual, to now we're running it against the top projects for Python, C+, we're doing Java, it's a bit weird. Um, we're doing stuff like Go. We might even do Ruby, because there's still some Ruby freaks out there. But we managed to do it at scale, and we got back reams, reams of information. And yes, we did use large language models to try and understand the information, because why wouldn't you do that? The next one is integration. We finally moved away from security tools being the odd one out to now where we can fit into the pipelines. And developers actually go, you know what? The build takes seven minutes. Hey, that's really cool. Like, we can actually do that. We're no longer pushing stuff out. And I think that's, for me, probably one of the biggest changes I've seen in two decades of application security, where we're finally being invited to the parties. And that never really happened before. Nobody wanted security people in the room. And I don't blame them. We are, we're an odd bunch at the best of times, right? But we're now being invited because we're not blocking. And then finally, knowledge. <coughs> one of the biggest... Biggest successes I've seen with OWASP is that we've shared knowledge that traditionally was never accessible. So Sam talked about ASVS, uh, and the ASVS has been a project of mine for a couple of years. Um, it's written in many languages. It's used across the planet. Um, I, I'm co-chair of UK government cybersecurity advisory, so I'm now doing civil service -y type stuff. And we're now looking at how we take standards like that and push it out to government so that people start building stuff. That knowledge is all open source. It's all in GitHub. People will do pull requests. And we've managed to do it so that it's no longer hidden. So at DevSecCon a couple of years ago, we, we were working on version 4 of ASVS. We didn't know who was using it. And it's a really odd thing to say, right? But when you work on an open source project, you put the code out there, you've walked out naked, you hope people don't laugh, but you don't really know who's using it. So I asked a very simple question when I did a keynote. Can anybody who's using it just come and tell me afterwards? Like, I won't publish it, just come and tell me afterwards. And lots of people did. We know that State Department's using it, we know that HMRC's using it. We know that we've got two um, nuclear reactors that use it. Um, and the knowledge is all there open for people to use and abuse and do what they want. What? NASA is Fucking amazing. <laughs> I did not know that. That's made my night. Um, like we have this ability to share knowledge. And that was always the idea right at the start of OWASP. 23 years ago, we were like, this kind of knowledge shouldn't be closed. It shouldn't be hidden. It should be available for everybody. And it sounds really cliched and corny to say that now, but that was kind of the premise. And I think this is where what's happening next as I go into the twilight of my career, what we're seeing with GPTs and how GPTs can be trained on that kind of knowledge. For the first time ever, really complex subjects, like understanding how to build secure applications, understanding how to write code QL queries, understanding how satellites work if you are Russian spies, is amazing. And that brings me into the guardrails thing. You better get that. <laughs> 10 years ago, like I said, security was that blocker. Nobody wanted to run security. The analogy that I've loved for a very long time, as I'm a kid from the early 70s, is that my parents used to love bowling. 
As a concept, boating is a bit weird. One, you used to put your feet into somebody else's stinky shoes. Never did understand that one. But basically, you could throw that ball down the alley. If you were really bad, they could pop up the guardrails down the side. No matter how hard, I still take my kids bowling now. I've got twin boys who are seven. They destroy everything. They hate authority and they want to break everything. They get that from their mother. <laughs> but the guardrails means that they can lob the ball down, the uh, bowling ball down, and it will hit the pins. We now have these guardrails. You know, that is SEMGREP, which is another open source tool which I completely love. It removed the need to have these expensive static analysis frameworks that are frankly rubbish, and people can use it and adopt it and put it to their pipelines. And on the right is CodeQL, um, sorry, SEMGREP and GitHub Actions. And it means that anybody can now start to do proper security and security engineering without getting in the way. And then you have this really cool thing, um, and that's coming in GitHub, whoever is using it soon, where you now have the option to do auto-fixing. So one of the things with CodeQL is that it can find really cool bugs, and then it will use Copilot, and it will suggest auto-fixes. And it suggests it based on the code base that it's learning from, so it can automatically do a pull request. So it will then reference ASVS to say why this is a bad thing, and I fixed your code for you, and do you want to merge that pull request? Security has gone from being the ugly people in the world that say no to we now have a benefit. We now have this really cool thing that application bugs are being squashed, and I've got AI helping me do it, and this is phenomenal. All that knowledge is being pulled together. So OWASP London is 20 years old. OWASP itself is 23 years old. I'm only 23. Um, I'm really intrigued, like, seeing so many people here still interested in application security. And I think the term application security has gone a bit weird. Back in the day, it was a browser, an app, a backend database. That web doesn't exist anymore. So I'm really intrigued to see what the next 20 years are going to bring from an OWASP perspective, from an application security space. Because if anything that we've seen in the last 20 years, the next five years, I think, we'll see probably even more revolutions than I had before. So a, a massive thank you for me for like being here, the fact that it's 20 years later for a little idea I had with my friends, Dennis and Ivan. And Ivan can say how he wasn't there, but he was, right? We started this. We never expected OWASP to grow what it was. I am one of the old farts of OWASP. I still get amazed when I go to the cons and see thousands of people. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the night.